Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Average Superstar TV. Please give the like, subscribe, share, and feel free to comment. We have a new show every Monday morning at 5 a.m., and this week we got a very special guest. For, uh, for, for us all actors out there, uh, we got one of the cast members from the original Clerks. This is Scott Schiaffo. Did I say it right? That's yeah. it. You got it. All right. Cool. Cool. We were just playing this before we went live. But I'll just be honest. So, uh, but uh, yeah, Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Yes. Yes. So, um, you're definitely someone's mind I could sit here all day and uh, pick at. So, in the early '90s, we all know. I'm kind of curious before uh, the Clerks thing even hit. I'm just kind of curious, like. Where did you even want to become an actor? How did you know? Well, I originally, my earliest passions were with music. Still are. I, I mean, music is my real number one passion. Uh, film acting is a close second. That happened much later. Um, but I grew up around a lot of music. As a child, I was raised by a very strong single mother, but I had an older cousin who was super into music and he sort of uh, just got the ball rolling at an early age. But as far as acting somewhere in my early teens, I began to really, the way music could make you feel the, I believe, I believe music is very magical. I believe that it's one of the art forms that touches all of us, regardless of uh, it breaks a lot of barriers but it could make you feel a lot of things and take you out of yourself. Film I saw was able to do that as well. And there was a movie, the, the movie version of uh, the musical hair actually came out when I was about 12 or 13 and it blew me away. Like I, I had my mom take I, me to go see it. I like really 10 wrote that movie, and I thought I called the ending at the end, and I was way off. <laughs> it was one of those, <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were gonna leave him. You know, I just thought they was gonna be like, "Grow up, we're we're leaving you." And I was like, "Whoa!" I didn't really I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I I uh, I grew up at a time when you know I was born in '63. So I you know I I, I got to see. In the 70s, music was amazing. Films were amazing. I'm not saying they aren't now, but it was a very different world back then, and it really made an impression on me. And um, I began to get involved in local theater groups, and I got involved in theater in school, in high school, and in college. But in my college years and then in my 20s, I still was primarily a musician. And by the end of my 20s, because I didn't, you know, I'm, a, I'm a little older than the rest of the cast of Clerks. Uh, those guys were all basically in their early 20s, most of them. And I was older. I was in my late 20s. I was actually 30 when the film was theatrically released, which isn't old. But back then, you felt like you were really old, you know. Um, but when the film was released and then eventually got... Uh, such a wonderful amount of uh, exposure and, you know, you couldn't keep up with the press clippings initially. I'm talking way back in 94 when there was no internet to speak of and no cell phones and it was a different world. But when it really took off, that kind of made me really embrace being a character actor and pushing that stuff more than the music. So I had a recording studio. I kept the recording studio. As you can see, I still have a project studio. but um, And I still do a lot of music with films and whatnot. But from the time Clerks was released till now, I put most of my energy into character acting. And, you know, no more bands. It was more doing studio work and doing music for film. But I caught the bug pretty early. And uh, I feel fortunate to have grown up with a lot of... Uh, really powerful influences like Pacino and Dustin Hoffman and of course Brando and all the guys in the seventies and eighties that, that sort of made character acting become, because 
you know, once upon a time, you were either a leading man or a character. There was very little in between, you know, long ago. But in the 70s, guys like Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino, uh, they made character actors leading men. Jack Nicholson, he's another prime example. These were not men that were considered leading men, but because of their powerful charisma and on-screen presence, they became leading men. And Hollywood saw what a leading man can be wasn't necessarily just old school model-esque handsome. It was, you know, the guy next door could be the leading man. So that, I just so feel very fortunate to have come up. That's awesome. So to back up for a second, I completely agree with you about the music thing. I, I would say I don't make music, but I got a thousand CDs. I've been to every concert in the world. I believe you can't touch another human being the way you could touch through music because in music – you have to give your undivided attention to the artist. It means you're listening. You don't get to talk. You know, you, you just take you downloading the info. So I always say that'll be first. But right after that, obviously, movies, characters, we, we, we all, you know, <laughs> they, they reach you, you know. So Absolutely. so bouncing around the, the area of the clerks, how did you even find out about this movie? And I guess one, two points. Yeah, how'd you find about that movie? And two is... Kevin looking at this as just a film to get like noticed, or was he thinking like a lot of us filmmakers, like we're gonna hit a grand slam here? Uh, no, he he was very realistic about just wanting it to make a splash enough to where he can continue a springboard, if you will. Uh, I don't believe he ever had a mindset of. Uh, Certainly nothing at all like what really did happen. That's why it's such a, it's a gift. It's a total gift. It's a dream come true for everybody who was part of it, not just Kevin. Uh, a lot of people's dreams came true with that movie becoming so um, well embraced and successful over many decades. Um, and I found out about it back then. Again, like I said, there was a different world. There wasn't internet. There wasn't cell phones. Uh, Actors would get trade papers. There was one called Backstage on the East Coast. It would come out once a week. You'd had only certain newsstands carried it. Uh, you ran out, you got Backstage Magazine, and there were one or two others that would list all the auditions on the East Coast, uh, whether it was New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And there was very little going on in New Jersey and Connecticut at that time. So when I saw an ad for... New Jersey filmmaker explores the day in the life of a convenience store clerk. There was no way I wasn't going to make it to that audition because films were not being shot in New Jersey uh, that regularly. It was, it was a little more of an anomaly back then. So I saw the ad. I was an hour and a half away from those guys. They were all South Jersey guys, shore guys. I'm way up North 15 minutes outside of the Bridger tunnel here. And, uh, Got down there. I, I did my audition. It was a prepared monologue. You didn't read from the script that first night. Wow. Uh, he had everybody do a prepared monologue. And if they liked what you did and he thought he had a role for you, they'd call you back and you'd get to read from the script. And I don't know about you. Maybe you can share some of this with your own experience. But usually when I walk out of an audition thinking I killed the phone doesn't ring. And when I walk out thinking like, eh, it wasn't yeah, my best yeah. effort, the phone rings. And yep. thankfully that happened. And they called me back and had me read for the Julie's guy. And then thankfully the rest is history, as they say. That's that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, but, so you actually, so you did your monologue and then you read for the part? Did they, just, did they see you as that? Right. What happened was like the, the, that, there were two nights. The first two nights were uh, for people to do prepared monologues. Mm -hmm. And then they looked through the tapes and then they called back. And then you read from the script on a whole different night, like a week or two later. And like a week had gone by and I didn't hear anything. And I was auditioning for a community theater show here up in Northern New Jersey. And, uh, then I got the call and they said, we'd like you to come down and read from the script. Uh, and those auditions were held at a different place. So yeah, the, the second audition, when you read from the script, uh, that's when you were up in that second level of running. 
and uh, they really liked my my reading. And uh, thankfully, I was hired at that second audition. Was was this considered like, uh, hey, we're gonna have this whole done in two weeks? We said we're planning for. Did you get like what it is going little by little, and you know, you know, we didn't get everything we got. You know, basically they had no end. It's just whenever they got it done. Did they kind of no, have he had. Oh, he did. He had a really, you know, Kevin's a, Kevin's a, a really intelligent guy. And I think we all know that yeah, now. Uh, and after getting to meet him and speak with him for a while, one of the first things I thought, cause I like, again, I was older than those guys. And when you're talking about five or six or seven years, as you get older, that doesn't seem like a big stretch, but when you're talking about 21 versus yeah. 28 he during those years, right. I was like he an old man kind of, you know, yeah. I was old, but I, I thought I could not believe just how intelligent, funny, and focused this cat was. And I thought, well, you know what? I know we're in really good hands because he's he was just hilarious to talk to. We would talk on the phone a lot back then, um, you know, both being indie film guys. Um, but no, he had a stringent plan and a stringent budget because you had to. You could. It's not like now, obviously, with the digital um, film is expensive and he also one reason why it's in black and white was a financial reason a lot of people thought it was an artistic choice but it was because he could not properly light the quick check without spending a lot more money to make it color so we went audio, audio, make make a film. Film. exactly yeah so yeah, exactly so no, i mean it was all well thought out in fact you know and he would be sweating if anything went beyond two takes like you got one take and then you would maybe get a safety if he felt you needed it or they'd move on because film was so precious um so yeah anything beyond two takes kevin would be sweating it out did uh you had um it was just all night shots too right because that was an active convenience store so you had a certain time limit right correct right he uh he would shut the short you know shut the he worked there during the day and then <laughs> shut the store down, pull down the shutters, which is why in the script, the shutters are down to give him an excuse why it was always shutters down and dark in there. But the real reason was because we couldn't shoot during the day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, uh, it was super exciting, you know, and uh, Brian O'Halloran who plays Dante, he, I did not get to know him well in the beginning but he set a very, very professional tone on the set. Not that Kevin didn't, but Kevin had a million plates to spin and balls to juggle. Uh, Brian really set a very professional tone as an actor, which I appreciated very much. And um, it, it was a couple of days of rehearsing. He did a lot of rehearsing, which oh, you don't always no. get for film. No, you don't. Um, no. And because uh, he really did shoot it almost like a play. Because he wasn't, he wasn't afforded a lot of coverage, and I know you know what coverage is. Yep. He wasn't going to have establishing shot, medium shot, two shot, close up. Everything had to be well thought out. I mean, all you really have are long shots and two shots at the most, and occasionally a uh, a tight shot. But when, um, when, when you got the when, when you, you got, got the, the, actual, got the role, actual role. role. How did, uh, How did uh, what did you think of the script? Were you like, wow, this is way different? Did you, did you know you had something good here? Well, great question. I did not get anything other than the Chulies Gum Guy pages. Oh, okay. You know, and that's very common too. I mean, when somebody's only, you know, in five, six, seven pages tops, they don't always give out the entire script. And especially nowadays when they want to try to keep things yeah. under wraps. Protecting um, the script, yeah. Right. Uh, he wasn't thinking that way then per se, but there was no real need to give each cast member a full script. So I only ever had the Chulies Gum Guy scenes. I never knew what came before or after until I got my screener copy a year later, which was so mind blowing to actually sit down and see the thing from start to finish. I had no idea just how insane and irreverent and wild it really was. When, um, when you got that, when uh, when you were shooting that, I understand being a film director myself, like, yeah, your, your press don't play around too much, but was there any really funny moment 
that like because there's a lot of is involved there that, or is that because the straight up we're shooting no no laughing here is there anything really funny moments going on during that well the days i was shooting uh no i mean there were nobody nobody broke during us during any of the takes um and i'm gonna say from what memory i'm recalling it's funny to say this, you know, you're shooting a comedy, but yet the atmosphere on the set was very serious mm -hmm. because of the stringent uh, guidelines of time, money. We can't, you know, we got to get it in two takes or else he's going to really be sweating. Um, had to get it done before the store opened in the morning. So the atmosphere was more, it was, a, it was, um, not that not that kidding around or joking was frowned upon, but there wasn't a lot of that, at least on no the days. I, yeah, there was no room Right, for there it. really kind of wasn't. There really wasn't. Um, you know, of course, once I finally got to see the film, man, I was just, I was floored by just how irreverent and crazy, you know, I just, that was, I, I didn't know what I was expecting, but you couldn't be expecting something like that because it's kind of like something you've never seen before. So, so forward, and, forward and ahead, like, yeah, it, the, the film gets distribution. And I remember uh, passing it on the video shelf and I remember seeing all the hands up. And I, I'm not going to lie to you, dude, I passed over it because it was an indie film. It didn't, you know, I and my, one of my friends told me, well, like, a few days later, did you see there's a new movie called Clerks? And he told me all, he was telling, he told me, just the Death Star part. And I was like, stop talking. And I just ran back to the video store <laughs> and I rented it. And like, I was all in. And that was really for me because I was in my late, you know, mid teens there. Like, I never really saw an independent film. So that opened up. My, that was the first like eye opener of like, wow, they just kind of hung around, but cool. You know, like, th th this is, this is great. So the movie's hitting. We're in that time. What's going on in your life? Is it, is it, like, do you see do you see the change? Are people starting to notice who you are when you're out? I was not. I tell you, I was when the first when the film first came out. It was only really. I mean, we're talking initially, initially when it was theatrically released. It was only in two or three theaters nationwide for the first six months or so. It was a limited, small release. It was in. The Angelica Film Center in New York, which I went to frequently, and I was a big New York guy. I love New York City. And it was out west in one place, I think, and it might have traveled around occasionally. But the point I'm making is it was uh, well-received by most critics. It was written up about a lot. But those first that first year, it was really only seen by the people who went to see it in the theater. And then the students at NYU would go every weekend. It literally played at the Angelica, Angelica Film Center for like six months straight. Like a Rocky um, Horror Picture Show? It kind of turned into ex that. Kind of a exactly, club. exactly. So, and also too, back then, back during those years, I auditioned for the film completely clean shaven. And I had my headshots were clean shaven. I was clean shaven pretty much all the time back then. Uh, there's a bizarre story about how I ended up with the beard for the character. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I had gone into the dramatist uh, bookstore in New York, which back then that was a very popular place for actors, producers, directors to go because it was a shop midtown that was just dedicated to plays, movies about films, movies about filmmaking. Uh, it was the dramatist bookshop. And I went in, I asked one of the uh, people working for something specific that I was looking for. And as soon as they heard my voice, they said, oh man, you're the Chewy's gum guy. And I'm, and I'm, was not at all expecting that. I was flabbergasted because of the fact that the film was still quite small. I didn't look anything like that kind of without the yeah. beard, but these guys, and he told me the story. He was a kid who was going to NYU because these NYU film students loved it so much and would literally have parties and go every weekend to see it, it really got in their head. So as soon as he heard me speak, he recognized it, which was really cool. 
But long story short, that kind of thing didn't happen much to me for many, many years. Still doesn't. Of course, at the conventions when we're all together, yeah. now the fans know who everybody is. But it's kind of nice because I'm part – the film – the film is really the star. Yeah. And of course, Jay and Bob. Yeah. And of course, yeah. Dante and Randall. But it's the film that is the star. You know, we just all happen to be very fortunate to be a part of it. That's that that's awesome. So right after the movie's done, like we're were you still obviously we're trying to go for more roles, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but- that it opened up, it opened up a lot of doors. It may have closed some too, because it's the type of film that received a tremendous amount of love and any, anything that gets a tremendous amount of love. A lot of blowback. There's yeah. even more yeah. for every fan. There's pro- for every, you know, lover, there's probably four or five haters. You know, it's still that way to this day. That's just the reality of life. But, um, you know, there were a lot of people that would call me in, and it would seem that they called me in more to talk about the movie than really nah. offer me a role, which wasn't horrible because now I'm networking with a lot of people who are in the business. But um, you have it to, did you open have to roll the dice, nice, though. Yeah, you have to you have to talk to them, like you, you right, hope right. they take you. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, it, it wasn't a bad thing per se, but um, it, it was it was an eye opener and I learned how to navigate the business in a different way. Cause every actor, when they're first in, in the beginning, we're all looking for a role that hopefully will stand out. And then that you'll have a little bit of recognition for so that you're not just completely anonymous because you know, you know, the term cattle call, yep. I've been to a million cattle calls where you walk in the door and there's three dozen people that are exactly like me or very much like me. And then that, that's very sobering. So you want that role that maybe is going to put you aside in their mind. They already know what you're capable of before you walk in. But um, it did help in that way. I mean, shortly after that, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael DiLorenzo. He was in New York undercover back in the 90s. Uh, he was part of that detective duo it was a show on Fox. It was, um, there was a, uh, it was an urban crime drama and it was a pretty, pretty big show at the time. All right. And I was cast opposite of him in a film that sadly never was released, but, um, we all know that too well. Yeah. (laughs) The story behind that is really, really, uh, miserable because before the film got released, Michael, who was a big star at the time, he had been killed off of the series before the film was released. And uh, it it hurt the film getting the same traction that it was given when it was given the green light to be made. Again, learning lessons that you, you got to take your lumps. You got to take the good with the bad. Working opposite Michael was a wonderful experience. It was a big set. You know, we were shot on, uh, we shot in Jersey city and New York city and, you know, trailers and 35 millimeter Panavision cameras. I mean, it was amazing, but, um, sadly the film never came out, but oh, wow. it's been a, been a wonderful ride. All of it. What, what would you say is, um, the pos- positive negatives of when you were doing it, this, that era in the nineties, early nineties versus now, would you say, obviously a little more easier or do you think the market's too saturated? What what would you say as an actor? Well, you know, I think that the reality is it is a, it's better now, better now for anybody hungry who wants to get in the game because you can do so much more without major studio money or you know that that freedom is pretty wonderful for all artists musicians and actors and filmmakers or whatever but the opposite of that is because that's the case there's just a landslide of tons of what you might want to say mediocre or subpar stuff out there that you could weed through for days 
and not like things get lost in the sauce now. I loved the music and film business that I grew up with, and I do miss it in a lot of ways. I I, I miss discs, I miss books, I miss bookstores, I miss records. I don't like you know. I know it's all trying to come back. But you know, I, I love to re any, any record store I see in America. I stop at. I do it all the time, man. Yep. yep. Good for you, you gotta, or else they're not gonna. You know, you don't want them to go away again. But you got a big one in Red Bank that I got lost in for about four hours across some Jay and Silent Bob's. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. Oh my gosh, I got stuck in there forever. That was the grand opening. I spent more time in the store than, than going to going to that. You know. So, sure. Sure. Yeah, it's crazy, but um. Do you have any advice for for any filmmaker these days jumping in it? Uh, advice for filmmakers specifically, or yeah, actors, musicians, or film, filmmakers? You want to do a collaboration? Well, I think uh, when it comes to making your making a career out of the arts, which is so difficult and always has been, and probably always will be because of the reality of the business. And, you know, it's a heartbreaking business. I, somebody once told me a long, long time ago that if you feel you, you could be happier doing anything else, that maybe you should do that. And that they, that the, it was a cautionary word of advice because of the monumental amount of, uh, disappointment and, uh, you know, most actors are going to hear, you're going to hear no, or you're not going to, the phone's not going to ring more often than you're going to get the gig. It's just reality. You could 20 auditions, maybe you'll get one or two things out of that, no matter how good or bad it, cause it's such a crazy game of lottery really. But I think that now more than ever, there are more opportunities, filmmakers, especially, you can go out there and do it now for very little uh, and you can control your art almost a hundred percent, which is good and bad because I do believe in the old system when you had other people who had to, that you had to keep happy, whether it's the studio or other producers. Yeah. I think other opinions are not always a bad thing. Yeah. But uh, now more than ever, if you want to get your film out there or get your record out there or the tools are in our hands for a minimal amount of investment, and uh, that, that's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I, I do love technology. I'm a, and I've always said between music and film, it's like uh, you can make, you can control your art, build your house, you know? And I always said, this is the best analogy I've been giving everybody. It's like picturing... You built a, a house, a apartment complex with 12 units, and everybody is loving it. Everyone's like, I can't wait for you to finish that. I, I, you know, I want to I wanna live in there. And then you get 12 tenants, no problem. And then at the end of the month, when you go to collect the rent money, sorry, we're not paying you. And we're, and we're staying in your house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I always say that, man, because you know, you know how filmmakers lose money. The artists in music, they lose money. They, there's always some piece of paper they'll throw in your face or, you know, expenses and this and that. So it's like you got to build that house, or that apartment complex and flex your muscle. Be like, oh, look how beautiful it is. But you're just eating the bill after bill after bill after bill because you're not you're not receiving anything. It's or you know, a lot of us aren't anyway. Right. No, it's it's tough. And the, and the, the reality of uh, streaming money as opposed to old school theatrical release, DVD sales, DVD rentals, Blu-ray sales and rentals. That's all dead. Physical, physical uh, product. I hate to call it product, but yeah. it's a physical thing that we used to have to buy to own. And yeah, there's been pirating and bootlegging forever. You could share it with your friend. Yeah. Somebody got the new CD and I, I taped it. Hey, if baby, I really hey, love speed. it. Yep. Yeah. High speed. Yeah. Yep. But if I really loved the band or loved the record, I it was gonna I was gonna buy it for myself. But um, that's still a key thing for me. I, when I see a show, I buy their CD, and I, and if I think their shirt's cool, I'm not just gonna buy a black T-shirt. I'm not into it. But like, if they got something cool, I like knowing that money goes directly to the band. That's me saying right. thank you. You know, right? That's yeah. great. That's a great way to be. Yeah. So, 
Uh, I'm going to lead into vulgar, but I mean, just what, as far as the clerk's world, I mean, are you still, was there relationships made after that? Or does somebody just like fall on the bay side? Some of the guys you talk to, some of you don't, or are you one good unit? Well, it's funny because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of mythology behind uh, that. And the story that was pretty much thrown out into the universe for a long time was that you know, this, this guy from Jersey made a film with his friends and family. And th that's not really true. A lot of people were friends and family, but a lot of us were just Brian O'Halloran played Dante. He just auditioned. He mm -hmm. wasn't a friend. He wasn't family. Marilyn Gigliotti, who played Veronica, she's an actress who was aspiring. She auditioned. I auditioned. Uh, yes, Jay was a personal friend. We all know that. Jeff Anderson was part of that crowd. So, yeah, he was a, a personal friend. But uh, a lot of the cast, we were actors who were hungry and looking for a break. So we weren't friends and family at the time. And I got to know Kevin pretty well that first year or two. But we splintered apart uh, as far as a friendship for several years. Um, I'm way up north and I'm doing my thing. And a lot of that was me personally, too. I kind of wafted off into, I had mentioned to you earlier, I had a good 15, 20 year run where alcohol and drugs were way more important to me than films or music anyway. But I kept trying to keep my career going. But yeah. I was pretty out there with, with the substance abuse. But it's the convention uh, culture that really re-established us all together and the fans, thanks to the people who love what Kevin does because of that demand. And because of the, uh, you know, the comic con culture, I became very close friends with Brian and Marilyn and a number of folks from the original cast. Um, vulgar, uh, Vulgar, by the time we shot Vulgar, I really hadn't seen those guys in a handful of years. It was like four or five years between the time we shot Clerks and then between the time Vulgar was shot. Um, but again, at that point, I still wasn't close, close with anybody there. It was more a professional relationship. And Vulgar was a wonderful experience because it was not unlike Clerks, only now there was a bigger budget and there was some buzz about, you know, Lionsgate would be releasing it. So there was no speculation as to uh, what's going to happen with this film. We knew it would get released. Um, it, I think it gets very unfairly criticized because of how brutal the storyline really is. But it's a pretty well-made indie uh, film with some fine performances. And, you know, Brian he Johnson is... signed up for by the name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gave, well, yeah. I don't know how much more of a warning you needed, you know? That's true. Yeah. You know, it came out on DVD in an unrated version and then an NC-17 and, you know, because it was so crazy and brutal and whatnot. But, again, I, I was very happy to have been a part of that film. But it's the last 10, 15 years that, on a social level, well, not necessarily social, but friendly wise, Brian and I have done a lot of time on the road together, Brian O'Halloran, uh, doing the conventions together. He's become a dear friend, um, but it, it didn't start off that way. Yeah, because you had the whole view askew thing going to remember seeing you guys. First time I ever saw you, probably, I don't know, 18 years ago was uh, Wizard World Philly. You know, I saw you guys like kind of, all, you know around the view askew table or close by it anyway, you know? So, right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that's great. So yeah. So would you, do you have any, what would you think is the right now you being in the business? What is the number one thing that comes to your head that filmmakers are doing wrong? Wow. Um, well, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question and it would be hard to pinpoint I would say, well, you mentioned something earlier. I think one of the signs of uh, indie film guy or a newbie who's not focusing on what's happening with his or her film is they don't give the audio equal 
amount of importance as the film, as the visual. Yep. A lot of guys get really hung up on the visual, guys or gals, or whomever, however you want to be referred to. I don't want to be yeah. disrespectful yeah. to anybody. Covered book. Right. You know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, however you identify, um, if you don't put a, put a good deal amount of importance on your audio, and that's not just music or sound effects, dialogue, everything, the finished audio has got to be professional because you see a lot of indie films i've seen films that look amazing but the audio is hideous and it, it the audio will break that wall of you know willing suspension of disbelief if you're watching something and the audio really throws you all of a sudden you go from being in the world they want you to be in to being in this thing where you're Looking at it differently, it, I can't say it's enough. Not, audio, and it and it kills the actor's performance because I said the actors and cannot shine with light, without proper lighting or audio. You you don't look real, right. you know. Right. I don't, I don't right. care if you stick Daniel Day Lewis in there if he's choppy, it doesn't work. Exactly, exactly. If the audio is poor, it really affects the film, and I don't think that a lot of new guy new folks realize just how important audio is i mean it's what's a film sound and vision sound and vision yeah it's not just vision with some sound you know uh, sound is really important and you want it to be clean and you want it to be where nobody's fighting to hear dialogue mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say the one thing that you really got to watch is your audio. Yeah, I, I have that right there. And the other one is just a mindset of, I call it the Rocky Three Eye of the Tiger thing, where you're more bragging about your film that's going to be the most amazing thing. And it's like you're cashing in the glory before you even, before you even start rolling cameras. I, I think there's a, there's a lot. I see it all the time, you know? <laughs> I'm even seeing directors now I hear like that are filming themselves direct live on social and it's like, yo, you got you gotta calm down, earn this, this earn this, you know. That's a good way to put it. I, I think because technology has allowed so much freedom and technology has given us such a great amount of tools available to everybody. Too many people think that they, you're right. You have to, you got to do, you, you've got to earn it. You've got to put your heart and soul in the project and let the project speak for itself. And if you're in it for fame and fortune, you're definitely in it for the wrong reasons. By far. Yeah. And I always said the ultimate thing is, I mean, when I made my, uh, my film, The Dark Military, I say this all the time. You got to be willing to take the chance as Kevin did with selling his comics and however else he pulled his money. I mean, I got money to investors, but I, I paid out of, I took loans. I, I, I starved. I, I, you know, I'm still, I was a single, I'm still a single guy with a mortgage. So I put my whole life in discomfort just for the sake of a dream. And I think that that is, what has to be done really. And uh, if you're in it for the long run, you've got to love it with a passion that you can't kill because it's a brutal, brutal industry at the end of the day. Uh, the entertainment field is bonkers. You know, if you're not in it because you really love what you're doing, mm -hmm. you got to, you got to examine that. And if you want to have fun and, you know, maybe uh, almost do take a hobby stance on it, that's a whole other thing. That's but it. if you I really want to empower the people like that, because then you don't got to worry about marketing and all that. You're just having some fun. Enjoy it. You know? Right. But just know the difference of someone who's put like a hundred grand into a film versus like you didn't put any money into a film and you made it eight minutes short and you think you're equal. Like, like, Right. <laughs> yeah. Chill. Right. You know? Yeah. So, and it's, it's the same thing with music. Like let's see, you got a piano right there next to you for anybody uh, <laughs> on YouTube. 
Well, Drew, is that like your, uh, you know, instrument of choice? Uh, guitar is my number one instrument. I grew up playing guitar from a young age, but uh, somewhere around 12 or 13, I began to noodle a little bit on keyboard. But then when I went to, in college, I took a lot of uh, arts classes and music classes, and I have a minor in music. Uh, so no matter what instrument you play, if you study it seriously, everyone needs some keyboard uh, background as a musician, whether you play oboe or guitar or whatever, we all have some piano uh, knowledge, at least when you start um, studying on any kind of uh, college uh, level. And I took to it and I, I, I just love music from day one, but guitar is the number one. Keyboard is uh, number two. Uh, I can get by pretty well on keyboard, but I would not put say, myself in. in when I see a piano or when someone says piano, some people might think of like a oh, great lame. I think of the best because one of the most important people that ever played the piano and one of my top favorite artists will always be Jerry Lee Lewis. So when I see a piano, <laughs> the killer. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah that's right. That's right. That's right. He was, uh, I mean, now there's... I, one of the first rock stars and it was piano. It wasn't guitar, you know, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think of the fifties. He lit that thing on fire, you know, today that's no big deal, but wow. He did that then, you know, like crazy. Oh yeah. And his charisma, you know, Oh God, freaking great. Cool. Cool. Um, my fr friend, this is one awesome interview. Scott, is there anything you want to plug? Feel free to go for your social media, et cetera. Well, it's, you know, I don't know the release dates and it's probably going to change, but Clerks 3 will be next summer. Is that, course, can I pause you one for a second before we wrap up? Ahead. I realize you can't, you know, give anything away. Is there anything story what any, anything you could throw on about Clerks 3 or is that something uh, way under wraps? Yeah, you know, I'm not trying to. Well, it's another, uh, it's another one of these instances where initially I was only given the Chulies guy hey. thing. Uh -huh. And he's talked about it enough on social media to where I wouldn't be giving away anything by saying it's a movie within a movie. So Dante and Randall go, they decide to shoot their own movie. They're essentially shooting clerks. Okay. So that's how a lot of us from the first one, you know, obviously now you could bring folks in because of that. So, I didn't know much else myself and they were really keeping this seriously under wraps. Um, but I got to see a screening at a convention, a private screening with Kevin and a few other people. And wow, yeah. like obviously I'm super partial, but I think he's done an amazing job of taking the story to this new place because it's essentially about Dante and Randall, but it's more Randall's story. So much so that if you weren't aware of the first two movies, this movie is a movie about two middle-aged guys who decide to make a movie. So in some odd ways, it could stand alone. Of course, you would miss all the inside wackiness. Yeah, yeah. But when I saw that, I was like, wow. And even Lionsgate, Lionsgate is even beginning to feel, yes, it's got a number in the title, so it's a sequel. Yeah. But it can appeal to people as a first-time movie, especially indie filmmakers. But, um, no, unfortunately, other than that, there's not too much else no, I can no, say. That's all good. And I, I've given a shameless plug to my friend Joe Garifalo, who was in my film, The Dark Military. He did the claymation for anything in Clerks 3. So, oh, right. I've heard, yeah. I know I've heard the name bandied around. Oh, yeah. He's posted. Kevin's posted it. So that's not giving any spoilers away of, of any kind. Right. Yeah. So that's awesome. Scott, I'll do this again. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Any social media or anything you want to plug, go for it. Uh, well, you know what? Thank you, Lauren, for having me on. Uh, I know that um, my name on any of the social media is where my social media is. Uh, please follow along. I appreciate every one of you. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I, I work with an animal charity called Angels of Animals. Off of my website, scottschiaffo.com, there's a link 
where there's very, very reasonably priced um, signed things from my castmates and myself. The money goes to the animals. Um, so scottschiaffo.com, Scott Schiaffo at Facebook, Scott Schiaffo at Instagram. I, I really suck on Twitter. I'm sorry. I just don't give him much, much time to Twitter. I need your brother. <laughs> I'm not very good with Twitter. Uh, I'm on there occasionally, but uh, Facebook and Instagram is where I spend most of my social media time. But um, I appreciate everyone who follows along and who have uh, supported all of my other projects along the way. It's a blessing and a gift. And I have a very grassroots career. I am fortunate to be blessed to be able to be in front of the camera sometimes, then behind the camera doing music for film or doing some kind of audio sweetening. Uh, I have my book, which uh, a lot of people were very supportive of. So I just feel blessed on a million levels. I, I feel very rich in that I've had such a fun ride so far and i it's i don't feel like it's anywhere near over obviously but i just want to thank everybody for being so supportive because the people that really love kevin really love kevin and it's amazing it's it's just a wonderful wonderful thing to have been a part of awesome well scott Schiaffo, uh thank you so much for being a guest of average superstar tv i humbly thank everyone who took the time to listen to the show Please give a like, subscribe, share, and uh, we drop an episode every Monday morning at 5 a.m. on YouTube, as well as Spotify and Amazon, Pandora, and iHeartRadio, and all the rest. So, uh, Scott, again, thank you for stopping by, and we'll see you on another episode of Average Superstar TV. Awesome, Lauren. Thank you so much, man. Thank you.